Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the 16th annual Learn East Technology and Education Conference. This is our first year hosting a virtual conference, which in and of itself is a learning process for us and part of the new educational norms for many of you. I'm sorry I couldn't join you this morning. My wife and I welcomed our new baby girl into the world yesterday. My apologies in advance for the limitations of this recorded presentation. It's pretty bare bones. We are living in exciting and turbulent times in the world of education. For the first time in recent history, we as New Brunswick educators are being asked to make a significant and drastic shift in how we deliver formal education to our students. Much of this shift involves moving the teaching practice to the realm of the digital. As seen in the media, a common thought from organizations such as the World Economic Forum and United Nations is that, globally, new solutions for education could bring much needed innovation. It's clear that organizations looking in on the education sector as a whole view technology as innovative, progressive, and an opportunity to better our classroom teaching. But what's missing from the dialogues is a more conscious and critical view of technology's impact on the classroom. We often hear of what technology might give or what it might allow us to do in education, but we seldom hear about what technology might take away or what sorts of things it might undo. My goal today is to encourage you to think about how technology influences the way we teach and what that might mean for learning how technology can change our behaviors and shift our mindset. Think for a moment about a technology you've already used today. Many of you may be thinking of your smartphones, which might have been the first thing you checked when you got up this morning. My question to you is, how has the smartphone changed the way you go about your day-to-day -day life, the way you communicate with others, the way you experience your life, the way you come to understand the world around you? If it helps, Think about how you experienced these things before you had a smartphone in comparison with how you do now. What devices did you get rid of when you purchased your smartphone? In general, how has the smartphone changed the way you think and act and feel and make sense of the world? Others may be thinking about your computer, which has given us all a safe means for connecting with each other today. But did any of you think about a book, a clock, or writing? These are all technologies too, which act as mediators between us and our world. These technologies also alter our experiences and ultimately shape our understanding in different ways. Binoculars, as a technological example, allow us to see a lot farther than the naked eye, but they also eliminate our peripheral vision, blinding us from what's happening around us. Similarly, I think we need to be careful not to blind ourselves to the ways technology limits us. Technologies are more than the gadgets we hold in our hands. A screen is more than a monitor that projects electronic texts and images and videos and sound. It's a medium that creates an environment in which we all experience things in a certain way. Now more than ever, technology is ever present and everywhere. Scholar Marshall McLuhan defined technologies to be mediators, which includes any and all technological extensions of the body and mind. This included not just digitized devices, but also the pencil, the alphabet, books, clocks, roads, and cars. As McLuhan and Culkin put it, we shape our tools and thereafter they shape us. They change the way we live in our environment. As Canadian scholar and pacifist Ursula Franklin put it, technology has built the house in which we all live. These days, we rarely get to live outside this house. So what does that mean to us as educators? I believe one of our roles as teachers is to understand our technologies so we can not just live in, but build the house of education with the effects and influence of technology in mind. Part of our job is to construct our own teaching philosophies and practices around the notion that the tools we use to make sense of the world actually shape our understanding of it. For many of us as educators, we've seen the evolution of technology, from teachers standing at the front of the room as the experts and source of knowledge, 
to the use of textbooks, encyclopedias, and the internet? Have we truly considered what effects to teaching and learning occur as we move from the chalkboard to the whiteboard to the smartboard and to the tablet? How have these shifts changed the way we work with students? I believe teachers can think critically about technology to better understand how it shapes the way they plan and teach and assess, how technology affects the way students communicate, learn, and reach their goals. A fun exercise I do with students is to ask them who invented the alphabet. When was it invented? Who invented it? And for what reason was it invented? It might seem odd to think of the alphabet as a technology or a human invention, yet the technology of writing invented by the Phoenicians to conduct and track trading between neighboring communities has shaped and underpinned our entire education system. We might also ask our students about the internet or computers. It may seem odd for students to think of a world without the internet or phones because they've never known a world without them, just as we have never known a world without writing. But these technologies have shaped our society and the way we learn. As we move ever more toward online learning and teaching through a screen, it's imperative that we consider how these things are shaping teaching and learning so we can make sound, conscious educational decisions around the way we help design and use technology to teach and learn. So what does this mean to us as educators and what should we do about it? I believe it starts with thinking about the ways technology influences the way we teach and as a result, the way students learn. This isn't a new practice for teachers. Part of our pedagogy is to reflect on the effectiveness of our own teaching practice as a way to inspire and support learning amongst our students. Part of this reflective process is our use of technology. But I want to move beyond the common practice of assessing how effective technology is for teaching and learning and move toward how effective technology is on teaching and learning. I think we need to reconsider the notion that technology only means innovation and progress, and that it improves the way we teach if only we use it properly. What we may not realize is every technology we use as teachers shapes our practice. Think of PowerPoint, what has argu arguably become a staple of teaching for many. How did the widespread use of PowerPoint change teaching? How did it influence the way we convey concepts and share ideas with students? How does it influence the way we teach and the way students learn? How does it guide our lectures? How does it promote or discourage dialogue? Let's take a quick look at the design of PowerPoint and speculate on its effects on teaching. PowerPoint slides use bulleted text as a default. When you start a new slide, there appears a text box with a bullet encouraging the teacher to head the page with the title and proceed to turn their ideas and knowledge into concisely packaged points. You actually have to go out of your way and delete or deselect the bullets if you have any other ways of you want to present information. And the text box only has so much room, so you may have to shorten or reevaluate the content you plan to include. The challenge in this design is determining what information to include on a given page and where to include it. The thing to note here is that some information gets perceived as more important based on its positioning on the slide. If you haven't read about it already, read up on how bulletized thinking contributed to the Challenger disaster, where seven crew members died and a multi-million dollar craft was destroyed due to an O-ring failure. Kathy Adams, a professor at the University of Alberta, argues in her work that PowerPoint's predetermined deck helps map out a clear, singular course for both teachers and students to follow. It's efficient and expedient, but this one wayness has a pedagogical consequence if the student's learning ends up being forced mechanically along an inappropriate path. Many of us have probably experienced this. We're teaching a class and following the PowerPoint slides, which act as a guide for the material we prepared beforehand. A light bulb in a student's mind goes on, and so they ask a question. Mr. McGuire, what about this? Realizing that the question is addressed several slides later and not wanting to deviate from the plan, we ask the student to hold that thought. It's not until slide 13. Do we risk stifling creativity, innovative inquiry, and teachable moments when our teaching practice is guided by this type of design? 
Technology can be distracting too. Adams determined that as PowerPoint is used to guide a lesson, the student is drawn toward both teacher and slide. In his attempt to attend to both, his eyes shift back and forth, back and forth. This shifting or split in attention is felt most acutely when the contents of the slide and the teacher's narrative don't bear a clear resemblance to one another. Here, the PowerPoint slides are perceived as disruptive to the process of understanding the speaker's meaning. The PowerPoint, like all technology, exerts what McLuhan calls invisible lines of force upon the choices teachers make when planning and presenting. It does so through its limited design and default options. But do these design limitations mean teachers should refrain from using technology altogether? Being an ed tech conference and me being a tech subject coordinator, you probably anticipate that my answer to this question is, of course not. So how should we approach technology as a teaching and learning tool? I think we would all agree from looking at today's sessions that technology has the power to open doors to communication, collaboration, innovation, creativity, and ultimately learning. Today, you will hear some strategies for using technology to improve your teaching and to empower your students. I want to add to these strategies by encouraging you to consider three ways technology influences teaching and learning. Number one, technology giveth and taketh away. New practices and ways of thinking are often accompanied by or the result of a new technology. Sometimes this means saying goodbye to the old ways of thinking and doing. I think it's important for us as teachers to ask, what can this technology do? But also, what might it undo? In other words, ask not only what is gained by using a technology, but also what might be lost. What might students learn, but also what might they unlearn? Think about how educational technologies of the past have influenced teaching and learning. Students' increasing use of the computer's QWERTY keyboard to type has shifted the emphasis away from pen and paper writing and almost entirely brought cursive writing to extinction. While typing on a computer is efficient, resourceful, and pretty much central to success in daily communication. Writing by hand is better for retaining information, developing fine motor skills, reading historical documents, and maintaining focus. Understanding the influences of technology affords us the opportunity to align certain technology with our goals. In order to do this effectively, it's important for teachers to consider not only what is gained from using a technology, but what also might be lost. Number two, every technology has a bias and an influence. You may have heard the proverb, when you're holding a hammer, everything looks like a nail. This notion comes from the work of many great thinkers, including Maslow's The Law of the Instrument. The Law of the Instrument is a cognitive bias that involves an over-reliance on a familiar tool. In other words, Technology influences us to favor and value certain perspectives and accomplishments over others. Neil Postman once said, every technology has a bias, which is an inherent influence over how we use our minds, in what we do with our bodies, in how it codifies our world. This makes me think of the use of predictive algorithms in today's web-based platforms. They're a good example of technological bias, Search engines and social media sites not only track human behavior in order to later predict what people are going to do, but they also use this data to influence our choices. We shape our algorithms, and thereafter, they shape us. Let's look at something that's very relevant to New Brunswick teachers, Microsoft Teams. Microsoft recently released 20 new updates to Teams that promise to better accommodate teachers. One of these new updates creates virtual backgrounds and spaces to accommodate the amount of people on a Teams video call. On their news website, Microsoft says the new feature they call Together Mode combines decades of research and product development to place all the participants on a video call together in a virtual space, such as an auditorium, a meeting room, or a coffee bar. So they look like they're all in the same place together. 
On the surface, this sounds like a cool feature to accommodate for the varying number of students on a video call. What needs to be examined here, though, is how changing the virtual background might affect and influence the experience of teachers and students. For example, might creating the atmosphere of a virtual lecture hall influence teachers to design more lectures? Is putting 20 students on a video call in front of the backdrop of a teaching auditorium in the best interest of teachers and students? This is a very easily visible example. But the thing about technology is it quickly becomes invisible and we don't always see its influence so clearly. Our first instinct when holding a hammer is to pound a nail. How might a learning management system, like Teams, influence our teaching? Number three, over time our technologies become cloaked in habitual practice and often go unexamined. New technological tools are changing how we teach, how we learn, what we know, and what we value. Yet, as Adams questions, how many of us question how these new and common and standard uses of software tools in classrooms may also be imposing limitations on our teaching practices and unintentionally shaping how knowledge across disciplines is being represented and shared? McLuhan used the analogy of a fish not knowing the water in which it swims to characterize humans' ignorance to the psychic and social effects of their technology. In the case of our technologies in educational settings, we may soon forget the influence and effects of our technology because they become part of our practice. Perhaps we stop recognizing the influence of our technologies because we assume that we're dealing with a progressive, innovative, and unbiased machine. Just as the alphabet has become a forgotten technology, we now risk computers being a mythic technological tool that is part of our natural, everyday approach to teaching. So what can you do? Being critical and aware of technology's influence is key. This is not only a job for teachers, but students too, inside and outside of the classroom. If we understand the influence of technology better, we can better serve our students. If teachers think of technology differently, with critical analysis, in what ways would it change their practice? Would they be able to use it more effectively, like knowing when to use it and when not to use it? That's for each teacher to decide based on their understanding of technology and their students. As educators, we need to constantly question technology's influence on our teaching and learning. I don't have the answers but I think the questions are more important anyway. COVID-19 has emphasized online learning out of necessity. The vehicle through which online learning occurs is a screen, but that doesn't mean that all learning must be done through a screen or through the limited designs of a device. Nor does it mean that just because we have more screens available to us in education, that screen should become the, way, the new norm through which to teach and learn. Given the increasing pace of technology use and the task you have ahead, the transition that you're being asked to make, you're going to face many challenges and successes in your practice this year and moving forward. For some of us, a screen has become a big part of our classroom, a tool through which teaching and learning occur. If schools are closed again, screens will become much more than a tool of the classroom. The screen might become our classroom. But we must be careful not to let the screen become the only learning environment. We must remember that our communities are also our classroom. Nature, our houses, our materials, people, our imaginations, they are all classrooms. What I'm asking you to consider during this rapid shift in teaching and learning is to be critical of the ways in which technology shapes your practice. We as teachers know that best practice involves reflecting on the choices we make in our practice to best serve our students. As you plan for an exciting and turbulent school year, I encourage you to teach beyond the screen and have your students learn beyond the device. We need to think beyond the screen as simply a tool to share content and communicate with each other. The screen has become our way of doing things in our school cultures what Jacques Ellul would call our technique, or what Ursula Franklin would describe as 
the way we do things around here. I'm not saying we shouldn't use screens. Now more than ever, we're seeing screens as a means to educate and communicate during a global pandemic. I'm encouraging us to look at how the screen is changing the way we teach and learn, for better and for worse. The practice of critically examining the technologies we use in education can better inform teacher pedagogy. As we move forward into these uncertain times in education, where technology and the use of screens in particular are given great emphasis as the tool through which to teach, let us be cognizant of the influences they have over our teaching practice. As educators, we can and should be more aware of how our technological tools shape our teaching. The computer and its programs force us to teach and learn in certain ways, but there's more than one way to cook an egg, or there's more than one solution to the problem of how to teach during a pandemic. If the computer becomes the tool through which we must teach, let's try to better understand how it influences our teaching practice and use it the best way we know how. You are about to hear stories of technology transforming learning, and you'll see how technology has been used in innovative ways by creative and passionate educators and organizations. You're going to hear a lot of good things today. You're going to see how technology has been used in some amazing ways. I'm excited for that too. You will hopefully take home ideas for your own classroom and think of innovative ways to enhance your students' learning experiences. I hope you also take into consideration the influence of technology on teaching and learning, both the things it gives and takes away. I hope you engage in talks with your teachers and students around the impact of technology on everyday lives in order to better understand it and make thoughtful, informed decisions around its use. I believe if you and your students strive to better understand, use, design, and create technologies, you can make our world a better place. Thank you and have a wonderful day.